main debate, I now call upon Damien Collins, Member of Parliament, former Chair of Consultative Committee at the Union, Sim Benis Hall, to close the case. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you for that sort of archaic reference to my deep past CV as well, sort of uh, as a former Chair of the Consultative Committee of the Oxford Union. Um, before I sort of turn to the substantive issues, I must say, I cannot remember being part of a debate where the opposition speakers have barely anything good to say about the people they are defending. <laughs> there's, a, there's almost an accepted wisdom that the big tech companies are a major problem to society and the world, and that we have to confront it. Their, their view is they have this broadly optimistic view that, well, you know, we always deal with these problems in history, therefore we deal with them again. I know the Cambridge Union has had some recent difficulty when debating Nazi Germans, so <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go there. But, but, but it's like saying the problems like the Cold War are major problems people have faced with civil rights. That people, if people have said just that, well, you know, humanity always comes through these problems. We'll come through them again. We don't have to worry about it. We would know those great reforms would never have been made. Those great reforms came. Those great challenges in history came because people stuck their neck out. They made a stand against fierce and bitter opposition in order to achieve a change that they recognized was necessary. The case that's been made this evening on this side of the house is that we recognize there is a severe problem. The motion is not we cannot defeat big tech. We can defeat big tech and the corporate interests go with it. It's that if we don't stand, if we don't recognize the scale of the problem, if we don't do something about it, then we will not survive as we've known today. And it's very easy for us in Oxford to say, well, of course we'll deal with this. We, know we always deal with this. But if you're a victim of genocide in Myanmar, organized and instigated on Facebook, it doesn't feel like that to you. If you are a vulnerable teenage girl who is being fed a constant stream of images of self-harm and self-abuse on Instagram, it doesn't feel like that to you. If you are someone in India, in a village in India, who is a victim of a lynching organized on WhatsApp, it doesn't feel like that to you. And you turn to the big tech companies and say, what are you doing about this? And you get a shrug. And what you get, and with all respect to DP, and I will say this, I will say this, I'll take on the Balliol man as a graduate of St. Bennett's Hall. I will say this, is it's very easy to believe the central narrative of companies like Facebook, which is that we do more, we do more good than harm, and therefore it's all okay. You know, there are 2.9 billion active users of this platform every month around the world. Let's say 1% of them egregiously abusing other people. That's only about 29 million you know, people do it every, every month, you know. So, you know, this, these are okay. Or, or is to say, and Facebook actually said this in response to the very brave testimony by Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, exposing and publishing research the company had done that it knew itself, that it wanted to keep secret from the world, that 30% of teenage girls in this country that use Instagram had heightened levels of anxiety and depression after using the platform, information they didn't want you to use, that keep secret from you, that they, that they have no active solution for that. They have no, no way of dealing with that directly, there's no way of addressing it. And they even said publicly, well, yeah, we understand that, but on balance, the, the overall user experience was positive. So what is the number of, what is, what is a safe number for young teenagers to feel heightened levels of anxiety and depression for using Instagram. Is 20% okay or is it 10%? Where are these numbers being set? What I believe fundamentally is it is not for people like Mark Zuckerberg to make these decisions. It is for us as a society to determine what we need to do. We are going through a period now where big tech companies will be regulated in the way other major industries have been before. And let's not pretend that was easy. And let's not pretend when Theodore Roosevelt started, you know, really gave you know, power to the antitrust movement, he did it with open arms. He did it with you know, a highly contested Supreme Court decision and a huge amount of political capital spent doing it because he recognized something had to be done. And that's where we are now. We have to recognize that it cannot be down just to Mark Zuckerberg and the other big tech companies to determine not just what we see, uh, and I think there was a sense that, you know, um, when I speak, said we have, uh, Tom, Tom, you know, massive agency, we have massive agency because of the iPhones we have in the palm of our hands. What they deliver is a highly personalized feed that for some people can give a highly distorted view of the world that preys on their fears and anxieties, that causes division. I do not believe what many, what the opposition, I think pretty much every sp sp speaker on the opposition side has more or less said so far, that what social media is, is a mirror to society. This is, the, this is these are Nick, Nick Clegg's talking points. Uh, here, this is, you know, these are, these are, you know, this, you'd be very proud, be very proud of you the way you've, 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 you've taken on board your brief this evening, um, which is to say, which is to say that you know the, um, that, that that you know these these are easy problems to solve. That these are these are these are that actually all that Facebook does, you know, Facebook didn't create harms in society, you know, it merely reflects the world as it is. 
I don't think it does. I think it's actively making these problems worse. It is actively causing division in society. It is actively turning communities against each other. It is actively playing on people's anxieties. These problems are becoming worse because of that company. And that company is doing this to make money. This is not, uh, this is not some accident. These businesses are advertising businesses. That is what they do. They hold your attention to make money out of you by running advertising to target you. And they do not care whether what they target you with is something that is divisive, something that, targets, that, that causes hate, uh, causes division in society, as long as it keeps you there. There's been research published showing that 60% of people on Facebook that join groups that spread extremist content do so with the active recommendation of the platform, people encouraging people to join it. Now, that's not because someone evil is there trying to, try to spread more evil. It's worse than that. It's they don't care. As long as you're there, as long as you're consuming content, then it's there. I remember one of my colleagues in Parliament said to me, just after the last general election, he said, I know you talk about this stuff a lot, but do people really believe what they see on social media? Does it affect the way people vote? We've all lived through a shared experience in the last two years where we have seen how what people consume on social media radically changes the view of their world. It would be impossible to see how the, the rising of, of conspiracy networks like QAnon would have been possible without social media, how the rapid spreading of anti-vaccine conspiracy theories would have been possible without social media. Before the vaccine program started in many major European countries, including countries like France, more than half the population believed the vaccine would be harmful for them and wouldn't take it. It was only actually people getting vaccinated who shifted that opinion. And the toxic debate created on social media is responsible for that. Now, Alex, in his tour de force, I think, uh, for, the, uh, for the proposition, also highlighted something else, which I think is an important part of this debate. And that is the experience of many people that work, not just for tech companies, but whose jobs are related to tech. I think gig economy workers are really good. Workers who do very basic jobs on very low pay, who have virtually no rights, worker rights, who are, who are basically get no pay when they're on, at their job for waiting for customers and jobs at all, have very little security in their position. That has become a normal way of working for many people. And it is linked to Mark Zuckerberg's big idea. Because the, one, of the people, one visionary writer, fiction writer, who set out this image of a dystopian future world where many, many people live in gated, gated communities and other people deliver stuff to them, probably not unlike living in Oxford College in some ways, but, uh, <laughs> um, but is, um, was Neil Stevenson, his novel Snow Crash, heralded by people in Silicon Valley as a great vision of the future. He came up with the idea of the metaverse. In the metaverse, in this idea is the world is so awful that people escape from it by living in a virtual reality. You know, because, because, uh, now that is, the word, that is Mark Zuckerberg's vision for the future of this planet, where to make money, he will actively encourage you to spend more time in virtual reality in the real world with real people engaging in real debates like this so that he can make more money out of you doing it. Uh, and that is based on a very dystopian idea of a broken society. Now, there is time for us to do something about that. But what it requires is, is parliaments, legislators, voted by citizens to set the standards to say this is what we expect you to do in terms of protecting workers' dignity, in terms of ensuring people are protected from harmful content, that you take responsibility for removing illegal content, things that is inciting terrorism and violence against women and girls and violence against children, that we set the standards for that and you have to follow them. Now, Tom, in his very compelling way, with his foreign office training, sets out that this could be, you know, we sit around a table with a cup of tea and a pencil and we just sort this out. <laughs> We come up with an agenda and it'll all be fine, it'll all be fine. Well, we know it's not gonna be like that. These are, these are very wealthy companies. They are hell-bent on preserving their business model and it will take legislation and concerted action to achieve that change. And the one thing I'd say finally as well is, this is what we've spoken about largely tonight is the impact on citizens and the impact of individuals. Mm -hmm. There are impacts on businesses as well. Let's not pretend that the big tech companies compete against each other. I often hear people say that, that Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook, they all compete against each other. What they are basically is virtual monopolies that control sectors of the economy. If you want to sell through Amazon, you're competing against a company that controls the selling space. They control your, the relationship with your customer. They don't give you any details or data about the customer that you're selling with. And they are perfectly at their rights to launch a competing service that will undercut you and will downgrade you in your ranking so no one will find your product. And it also means that the consolidated power of the tech companies remain. Because the reason we have no UK challenges to these businesses is that if we did, they will be bought, as, as, as was said on the side earlier on. They will be bought out, their market will be taken away from them, they would not be able to compete. So we need to protect the rights of the citizen, we need to protect the rights of the workers in the tech sector, and also we need to protect the rights of businesses to compete in a fair way. These are issues that other industries have had to confront in the years before. I believe cars are better with seatbelts, it doesn't make me anti-car. Now I believe tech will be better 
with better standards enforced through legislation. And I believe we can't wish that to happen and that we can't believe it'll happen because it's always happened before. We have to make it happen. And that's why you have to support the proposition. Thank you.